And so we will start this meeting of the uh, Regional Planning Commission. Thumbs up, uh, Charlie. Go ahead. Everybody okay? Sorry. Yep. We've got, because I know we have a quorum, right? Because uh, Amy told me we did. <laughs> um, there is no consent agenda, so we can move right on to the deliberative agenda. And uh, is there any, since we've got the call to order and the attendance, is there any changes to the agenda? I don't see any hands and um, Amy hasn't said there's anything else going on. If she saw hands, so that's good. Um, so now we move to public comment period on items not on the agenda. And I do see one and I recognize the face, Chuck Lacey. <laughs> so Chuck, if you, if you want to speak for uh, items not on the agenda. Sure. Um, I'd like to speak to your work plan for the next year. Oh, that um, will be later then, uh, Chuck. This is for items well, then not I'll, I, I'll speak more generally then okay. um, regarding your 5,000 unit housing goal. Um, I'd like to see you address with more specificity the expectation of outlying towns. Um, I'm thinking first of Jericho, where I live, but probably other similar towns to Jericho. Uh, the Jericho Select Boards, and I'm talking about you know the, going decades past, has a long-standing practice of yeah. encouraging big houses on big lots and discouraging housing for low and moderate income people. In the majority of Jericho, you can build a 10,000 square foot house by permit, which is half as big as Patrick Jim, but on the same lot, it's illegal to build a 3,000 square foot house with three one bedroom apartments. These zoning regulations are designed to limit the number of dwellings available to low and modern income people. The justifications cited by Jericho include town character. Jericho is an example of a national problem that I'm sure you're familiar with, um, with respect to housing equity and fairness. The Jericho Select Board has said they did not sign on to the 5,000 dwelling goal and sees no particular obligation for Jericho in meeting that goal. Until you hear otherwise, I think you need to count uh, Count Jericho out. I think if you were to bring specificity to the goals, but for outlying towns mm -hmm. and meeting the regional goal of 5,000 ho uh, housing dwelling units, I think we can have a better discussion uh, in Jericho and other towns like Jericho about whether we intend to be participants or passive observers in solving the regional housing problem. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, I just want everybody to know that tonight I'm the Essex Junction alternate and you know everybody's used to seeing me do the town outside the village for Essex and Tracy's here to do the town outside the village representation. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, I see a comment from Bard. Yeah, I appreciate Chuck's comments, um, Bart from Richmond. So um, it's interesting. Uh, I'll just observe that it's um, there's a two or three tiered question here, which is not just select boards, but then planning commissions. So at least in our town, the core, you know, the real work on the zoning happens at planning commission first and select board second. So it's probably even more complicated than a single elected body's opinion. It's um, it's planning commission where it started to end. For what it's worth in a similar size town, there is support at the moment, at least in both the select board and planning commission to deal with it. But um, substantive progress is um, slow, I would say that. Thank you, Bird. All right, Chuck. Well, I'd say in, in Jericho, the planning commission is not in the town charter. It's really the select board that's responsible. But their planning commission is staffed to the select board, in effect. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the planning commission uh, it works for the select board. So the zoning regulations, at least in Jericho, are the responsibility of the select board. 
So when you've met one town, you've met one town. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. Um, this is an ongoing issue, so I, you know, I don't need to take, you know, discuss this at the uh, regional planning, you know, for, uh, take the regional planning time to discuss this. We will discuss it tomorrow night at the uh, Jericho Select Board meeting. So uh, we need to move on then to, uh, <clears throat> oh, the, I don't see. I think it's item three, the public forum for potential FY23. You can we need to do, okay, yeah, we need, to, I was looking at that and went, wait a minute, minutes usually next. <laughs> Sorry. So this is the, we, do we need a motion to open the public forum or just is it a public discussion? Yeah, this public discussion. From our All right, is there anybody here to discuss the uh, FY23 UPW projects? And obviously, Chuck, you've, you know, um, spoken on that as well. Uh, is there anyone else from the public to talk about UPW um, projects? I don't see any other public uh, comment there. Um, so without uh, any public uh, input at the moment, we move on, uh, which would have been the consent agenda of which there was none. So um, we, should I say? Sorry, Charlie. Sorry, Catherine. Yeah, we got a uh, question in the chat. Uh, what is oh, okay. the UPWP? Apologies for that. Thank you for pointing that out, Mr. Arnold. Uh, it, it's our unified planning work program. So it's basically our annual work program uh, for next fiscal year. And uh, we're kind of taking some early comments on that now uh, to see if there's any input uh, before that committee starts going the next uh, few weeks. Because the... Um... Applications are due on the Friday, as I understand. That's correct. Uh, okay, moving on then, uh, we have the minutes from the November 17th board meeting and reading it, it feels like so long ago. <laughs> that I, was, I'd you know, move approval with corrections, Madam Chair. Do we have a second? I see Garrett's hand. I have corrections, but if other people have, they can go first. Oh, uh, don't see anybody. <laughs> All right. Um, Something new and different. Yeah. I well, thought... I usually say with Catherine's corrections, but, um, you know, I didn't just. <laughs> I thought, you know, I'd give other people a chance, <laughs> but I do have corrections. Um, on page four, on line 40, we uh, have uh, on line 47, we have overall Chittenden County population grew 8% and from 156. That, I think we should completely eliminate that line and then go to page five, which is um, Saint, num line number one, St. George had the highest percentage because that is also uh, line 46 on page four. And then we're going to see overall Chittenden County population grew from 156 to 210 uh, in 2010 to approximately 160K in 2020. And that's the repeat of the line. And it makes more sense in this paragraph than standing by itself at the other page. You understand? Because those were two repeats sentences that I can email you and we can um, delete one of the sentences. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, to my mind, the, the, it belongs in the over Chittenden County population growth belongs on nine and lines nine and 10 on page five, as opposed to on uh, <clears throat> page four and line 47. So thank you. Okay. Actually, I, I get it now. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, all those in favor of the uh, minutes with corrections is noted, say aye or raise your hand. Whatever. Aye. 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 Well, thank you all. The motion passes. Uh, is there any um, abstentions? Oops, Deidre has a question. No, her hand is up. Are there any abstentions for November? Okay. I abstain since I was not present, Brad Holden, Underhill. Thank you. All righty. Um, 
We're going to move into one of our discussion items, which is the equity assessment report review. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll, uh, so uh, we sent uh, two links or uh, uh, documents. Uh, I think we had the short version in the packet and then a longer, the full report was a separate link. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but um, I can uh, share if you want to look at the executive summary. Uh, just well, I was going to walk through that with you, if that's OK. Um, and um, so uh, you may recall uh, that uh, last year we sorry, this um, let me take a moment to make sure I can uh, see you all here. Uh, can you see the document now? Yes. OK. And I'm sorry, I'm playing around with my screen here for a second. Um, so uh, if, as you remember, uh, we, uh, or may remember, we contracted with uh, Creative Discourse uh, last year as an equity consultant. Uh, and they've been uh, working with, they formed an equity leadership team. You may, re may remember some appointees uh, from the board, Mike and Jackie uh, and uh, Elaine Haney from the Essex Village. And uh, Justin Rabideau from, uh, he's an alternate from South Burlington. Uh, we're on that committee. Um, and we uh, kind of concluded most of the public work at a November 6th equity summit. So, um, and then they've documented all of the work. There's a lot of engagement work that happened outside of that summit. Um, so in, the, in this document here, uh, there's some background. Um, about the issue of uh, racial hierarchy and uh, systemic racism and unequal resource distribution. So I um, wasn't gonna spend a lot of time on that, but just so you uh, get some flavor of uh, where the consultant team is coming from. Um, so they gave us uh, three, I'm gonna again get down to the recommendations uh, just so you have a sense of where we are now. Um, so the first category of recommendations was about centering justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in our work. Uh, so this is a little bit more, this first set is all internal looking. Um, we're gonna uh, follow this up in our budget. Um, but the first item was hiring an organizational leader. So a staff person uh, kind of focused on this. Um, and then as we go through here, you'll see why that's probably important. Um, the second idea was to expand that equity leadership team to include some uh, external folks and, uh, and be more uh, diverse. Um, the third item was more uh, ongoing education and training of board and staff. So we did a little bit of that with the board last year, uh, more of it with the staff. Um, establish a process for conducting many equity audits uh, ahead of key decisions or projects. So I think that's you know, something we've had a little bit of that in our uh, our uh, public participation plan where we kind of do some early evaluation to see if there's a need for extra engagement. I think this is step taking that process a, a step further, uh, which needs uh, some work. Um, and feel free to interrupt me if you have questions about what that might mean for us uh, on any of these. Um, and then um, kind of, uh, focusing a little bit more of our resources on, on engagement and relationship building at the front end of all projects. Um, and you know, I think as we try to digest that, that may not be needed for all projects, but maybe projects in uh, ge different geographic areas of our region. Uh, but I think it's a good point in general, uh, more investment in our engagement work. Um, the second category, is more external facing about uh, prioritizing connections with diverse populations. Um, so an idea here about uh, can we make, you know, our formal, we have a lot of meetings between committees and board meetings. Um, can we make those more open uh, to uh, different people from different backgrounds in our community? Uh, so that's something to think about. Oops, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, and about how to go about doing that also is going to require some work um, and you know, which things we can do that and, and, and which things we can do part of it. Um, 
Uh, and then this is participating in external group activities, um, which we again have done some of, uh, always more to do there, um, create opportunities um, for uh, external, particularly BIPOC and, and mar people with marginalized identities to um, engage and intentionally inform our work. Again, we've you know done some spots of this, uh, but I think how to systematize that and get that better uh, is some opportunity for more work there. Um, and then uh, finding opportunities to uplift and celebrate BIPOC-led organizations. Again, uh, something we've done some of and we can do more of. And then the third category is I think really following up from that equity summit that we did in on, in November, um, you know, can we do more things like that um, and have learning opportunities for uh, people working in the region on this, uh, convening leaders, um, and just and then also just the connection with the municipalities. Um, so uh, the equity leadership team, you know, gave some uh, input into the draft of this uh, back at the end of December. We kind of got this right around Christmas time, I think. Um, and uh, you'll see in the next, well, I don't know, any questions on this? Uh, but I was going to say, quick, long story short, uh, I am recommending in the budget adjustment uh, and the uh, revised mid-year UPWP that we um, do budget to uh, hire a staff person to specifically focus on this work um, in the coming months. But any quick questions I wanted you all to be aware of this report, its recommendations, and hey, Charlie. Yes, sir. It's Mike. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that. Can you maybe expand a little bit on um, number one, uh, and specifically, we had talked about um, the possibility of of making a board position, and that was I'm going to say discouraged. I don't know if that's the right term or not by the equity team that we, the consultants we worked with. Um, and the other thing too, is that we had a discussion, uh, I think at the executive committee meeting last week um, about the fact that this report, these recommendations uh, focus on race as opposed to more globally economic uh, um, issues and, and one as long as well as race. Can you touch on that maybe a little bit? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mike, for, um, um, and I think, uh, let me talk the first idea of, um, first. Um, yeah, there was some good conversation, you know, about like, should we uh, try to get, um, you know, just like we have a, you know, a transportation, oh, no, that's not a good example. <laughs> we have a business seat, a, you know, conservation, natural resource seat on our board and an agriculture seat, you know, should we have an equity seat? So there was some discussion with the consultant team about that. Um, and I think they had some concerns. Uh, this is my interpretation, <laughs> um, not their words exactly. Um, but they had some concerns about kind of not doing the work, but just kind of leaping to that point um, and that it might feel kind of like tokenism. Um, and maybe not be an effective first step. But I think this, uh, in this second category, the first recommendation here about our meetings and things, I think this is um, probably putting us on a path where maybe that is one of the outcomes. Uh, maybe we have a board seat, maybe there's a seat on the TAC that's uh, focused on equity or, or some of our other committees. Um, so I don't think uh, we know exactly how this is going to evolve, but, um, Mike, I do think that kind of remains as a possibility. Um, it just wasn't one of the first steps that they thought we should take um, with regard to that. And then, and your second point about um, the focus on race um, is uh, a, a good issue to talk about. Um, and I think uh, when we've had uh, creative discourse at the board meeting previously, I think we've had a little bit of conversation in this regard, but um, it's, I think from, from their background and working on these uh, issues and difficult and challenging issues, um, they've uh, come to the conclusion of kind of a race first approach to dealing with uh, inequities and, and marginalized communities in, in our community. Um, and so uh, Sue Corbett gave, gave me an analogy that was kind of helpful for me to think about um, because, and Mike's point is good, like we are, we are talking here about um, 
how to really hear from people. And we've always had these Title VI requirements uh, from uh, federal requirements to engage marginalized communities and underrepresented communities. Um, the question is how to do that more effectively. And those categories are not just race, they're ethnicity, their abilities, their um, genders, uh, you know, just uh, income, uh, right? Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot covered by those uh, categories of underrepresented or marginalized communities. Uh, but their feeling is that if we talk about race first, it will benefit everyone. And the example that they gave me was uh, talking about the American with Disabilities Act, if, if some of you may remember back to, I think it was 1990, right? And all of a sudden we had to do things like um, put in ramps at sidewalks uh, for you know people that were in wheelchairs, right? Like that was not a requirement before the American with Disabilities Act. And their uh, analogy was, yes, that was about people with disabilities, but it just, it didn't just benefit people with disabilities. It also benefited the rest of the community so that, you know, kids on a bike or uh, a mom with a stroller or dad with a stroller or a guy making a delivery on a hand truck was also able to benefit from all those ramps and uh, accessibility improvements that got made. And so their analogy was kind of like, this is a little bit like that. If we um, make it better for uh, people of color to engage, that will also benefit all of the other marginalized uh, communities in our community. So. I don't know if that's helpful to you. It was helpful to, to me to think about that as an example. Um, but, and it is, I think, Mike, this is going to be a recurring issue of, you know, how focused and narrow is this versus how broad. Um, I'm sure we'll keep coming back to that as we think about how to operationalize some uh, improvements. Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. That's all I was looking for. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Mott. I, uh, I'm i trying to think how to phrase this. I think most of the folks on the board know that I'm pretty darn liberal. Um, that being said, I found number one really offensive, um, not towards us, but to claim that using Robert's rules of orders is confusing and inaccessible to marginalized people, the implication there is as well, they're not capable of understanding it. And I understand that we're dealing with pendulum swings and various different points, but Number one, far less than any of the others, really bugged me. And I felt a great deal of it was inappropriate on their behalf, not so much on ours. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Bard? Um, thanks, Garrett. It's Bard. Yeah, uh, you know, I wrestled with this a little bit. I will say I've seen like if you watch Congress using Robert's rules of order, you know, I've seen people get lost like uh, an amendment to the amendment to the amendment. No, that's out of order because you can't amend the amendment to the amendment. You have to go. So I have seen that happen. But honestly, in my experience in Vermont, I haven't really seen that happen. I've seen it used in a semi-structured or semi-formal way. Um, so I, I sort of stumbled on this one a little bit that, you know, perhaps a parliamentarian strict approach to Robert's Rules of Order would be off-putting and inaccessible, but generally the semi-structured approach that I've seen has been actually probably helpful um, to give some structure and you know, without saying who it's confusing to or inaccessible to, just an observation about the difference between the strict adherence and sort of the practical ad adherence that I've seen. And for that matter, if you're gonna play baseball, basketball, football, whatever, there are rules. 
And I'm not saying we necessarily have to have strict rules. However, there needs to be guidance for how things are discussed. Otherwise, it's a complete free for all. So anyway, the for me, the biggest impl uh, implication of that, I felt was completely bigoted in what they had to say, which rather blew me away. Thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions? On anything in the uh, report at all? Yeah, I, I do have one if nobody else does. Uh, I missed that. Who said yeah, that? Yeah, that was John. 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 Uh, First, we, we, I think we need to be a little sensitive to sometimes um, we get lost in cultural differences. Um, you know, Robert's rules, for instance, is something we're all used to as a culture. When you have um, people from a foreign land come to our land, um, they do things differently back home. And the culture sometimes can be confusing and off-putting, and that can actually make it discouraging for them to participate um, you know one of the easiest analogies i can use is just when it comes to medicine you know culturally if you see a doctor that is understands your culture um they can treat you better because they have an innate understanding of what you go through where someone from a different culture certainly can do medicine wonderfully but if they don't understand what your real problem is because they don't understand what you're trying to say, um, that can be an issue. And that's very much a problem in the medical industry when it comes to, to different cultures. So I do, I understand all the thoughts that were put on the table here, but I read it as in just needing to understand that cultural differences can and how welcoming people feel um, butting up against those cultural differences can be a roadblock to participating, which then can be a roadblock to our understanding and doing the right thing by all of our constituencies out there. So we need to be a little careful that way. And it is sort of with that in mind that, Charlie, I wanted to bring up, I haven't had the discussions with the folks who wrote this, and it's their report, not ours. Um, so I, I get that we don't need to be overly concerned about um, a lot of little details because this is not our report, it's their report to us. But in number two, uh, I wanted to understand how these words were used. Um, and the first one in number two, the greenish, um, they use the word um, experts. And in number two of uh, the green, number two, they, they use the word um, authority. So I'll read the, the parts of the paragraphs that I'm, I'm looking at. I was wondering how, the, how I'm supposed to interpret the words um, of experts and authority, um, where in number one, um, it's the middle of it. It says, make changes to these procedures and processes and even disrupting the typical meeting structures and locations is critical to shift away from dominant culture as the norm and instead create new norms where community members, especially people of the global community and other marginalized groups are regarded as the experts. So I, I, is that experts in their culture? And we're supposed to un use them as a way to understand where they're coming from? Are they trying to say that their opinion should then be above everybody else's because they are the overall experts? I kind of think they're talking about the former, not the latter. And in a similar sense, in the second one, um, uh, the second to last sentence says, they also serve to disrupt the centralization of dominant culture and creates a space where marginalized culture is uplifted as the authority. So again, are they talking about the authority as in trying to communicate what the real issues are so that we understand them better and can uh, understand what our constituency, their, our constituents are getting to, or are they trying to say that um, these marginalized groups should be the authority and we need to do what they say? So people are going to read this. Uh, people generally read an executive summary first and never read the actual report. So I'm trying to understand what is actually trying to be said there. Um, the two examples I gave, I believe it's the former and not the latter that we're, they should be listened to as experts in their culture to tell us 
what it is that's important to them and why certain things don't work or do work? Or are they trying to tell us that, that we need to put um, these constituencies higher above the rest of our constituencies and consider them the experts in authority? So I, I'm, I'm just trying to understand what it is that they're trying to tell us here, Charlie. Any insight into that? Yeah, my impression, and um, I don't know if Emma and Brian are on here too, they've been uh, doing most of the staff work with uh, Creative Discourse, so if they have uh, deeper knowledge than I do on that, uh, well, please pipe in. But my impression is that um, that this is coming from the context of trying to address equity issues. And so, yeah, I think you're right, John, that it's the former, like, you know, we should um, listen to the people in those communities about what's important to them and they're the experts in what how things affect them. Um, and we shouldn't assume how it affects uh, people that aren't engaged, right? So we need to increase our engagement there. So I think it's, I, that's my impression. I don't know, or Jackie or Mike, I don't, I don't know if you have other impressions. I agree. Okay. I agree. I, I just wish as a wordsmith, um, it was, again, for people who are just gonna read this, haven't been engaged in the process, I haven't been at these meetings. When you read that, you can read it both ways. And that's sort of where hard feelings get put in. And, you know, maybe they don't say to your face, but they go away thinking something that they shouldn't be thinking because it's not what the what is actually going on. And I just wish that they had um, wordsmith those things a little, little better to um, really tell us what it is that they meant. Yeah. Yeah. So just, okay. just, just some constructive feedback. Again, yeah. it's their report, not ours, but I, that is something I just kind of wanted to bring up. Thank you. Garrett? Um, thank you. <clears throat> um, I agree with what John said there. Uh, it was not well written. Um, another piece to address, I think, is the comparison between a board position as a yeah, at large uh, commissioner or a staff a staff position showed a misunderstanding of how the RPC works. Um, it's not, you know, staff is in support of the commissioners and yeah, of the board members, not the other way around. And of course, we all listen very carefully to everything staff says, well, except maybe Charlie. Um, <laughs> but uh, Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Catherine, if I can. Oh, okay, Mike. Sorry, I just want to pick up on, on Garrett's comments because we had quite a bit of conversation about that uh, in the, I know in the equity leadership team or and or the executive committee. And I think, I think where we ended up is the staff position um, is one that, um, you know, that person can be involved with staff and look at all the projects and, and give the input right there and make recommendations to the board. So that's a, that's a, um, an important and probably more beneficial. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, but it's got more, uh, input, if you will, to projects to look and see through the lens of, of equity, you know, the, the impacts that might be going on. I, I happen to agree with you, Garrett. I think a board position would be good. But like I said, the, the consultant team, as Charlie said, kind of downplayed it more as a, it would be seen as a token gesture. And what would, what would then happen, um, you know, going forward? Is, is that the only step you'd take? Charlie, I don't know if you want to pick up on that kind of rambling or not? <laughs> not, not rambling, but um, no, I think, I, and I think part of what I was hearing from them was um, that we do need to do more staff work to prepare 
um, you know, whether wh whatever we're looking at, a policy, a plan or project um, and, and the engagement work to do work um, to address equity so that um, if we did have a seat on our board devoted to that topic area, that there was work done that they could um, feel supported. I think they were worried about a board member just kind of by themselves without support from the staff um, would you know feel tokenized and not um, not have enough support to make a difference in addressing this issue. But, uh, again, my impression, not not their words. That's on us to make it work, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and uh, and I think I think we definitely feel that at a staff level that we you know there's more work to be done here that we are really not properly staffed to accomplish right now. Well, thank you. I mean, this was a very good discussion. Is there a, a, any more before we move on to the next uh, item on the agenda? Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Yeah, that's right. Uh, saying that, we have... Um, hey, Barbara. I mean, Catherine, I'm sorry. It's okay. Just, Charlie, the equity... <laughs> the hair gets funny all the time. <laughs> we all look the same. Sorry, you know, I'm... What can I say? I'm getting old. Um, I, I don't recall, I don't have the agenda in front of me, but uh, we have an open position on the equity leadership team. We're mm. going to talk about that later. We're going to do that under your report, Charlie. Um, thank you for bringing that up. That probably would have been a good thing for me to remember when we talked about changes to the agenda. Uh, apologies for not remembering that, Mike. Um, yeah, so I don't know, uh, Madam Chair, if you want to uh, address that topic. Um, to be uh, transparent, Justin Rabideau has uh, left employment with the city of South Burlington. So there is uh, a vacant seat on that equity leadership team uh, that's available. I don't know if you wanna talk about that now. Um, and well, see. because we're talking about equity, uh, I, I I think we can, uh, it makes sense just to fulfill it rather than, you know, break this discussion up and then put it in the exec, you know, executive director's report. Yeah. Makes sense to fill it in now. So I guess that's a question to the board members. Is there uh, anyone who might be interested in filling that seat now that you heard how much fun this could be? I was gonna say, who wants to come join Jackie, Elaine and myself? You know, this is Bart. I have a follow-up question and, and this is informed by three other groups. This is the fourth group that I've um, at least tenuously involved in dealing with diversity, equity, inclusion. And people are using these words in different practical ways. So I've started to call out the question when you say diversity, equity, inclusion, <clears throat> who are we talking about? And here it seems strongly correlated with racial equity. And then the other groups just, and I'm not saying this is good or bad, it's just an observation. <clears throat> when I called that out, in our local town, what do we mean? Does it include the other things like gender identity, religion, cultural identity? People said, oh, it's all that, and started talking about other things. And in another group I'm working with the state, its first emphasis is race, but is also interested in gender, um, disability and other things. So it's just an interesting question, an observation that sort of that first the scope and then within the scope, what is the relative priority differences that seem to appear to me? I don't know if that's a useful observation or not. Yeah, and, and I will say just to be clear that I think we're more in that third category um, where the consultant has recommended um, using race as a introduction put to addressing equ you know, equity issues across the full spectrum. And, and really, and to since nobody wants to speak up tonight. <laughs> I'll pass it on to Charlie and Catherine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and happy to have a deeper conversation if somebody you know, wants to kind of talk about it before volunteering. And I would think either um, um, Mike or uh, Jackie would be the ones to talk to about that because they are on the uh, on the uh, you know board as well as the uh, leadership team. Okay, next is the 
draft FY22 UPWP mid-year adjustment and budget discussion. So, uh, hello again. Uh, I'll take. Got in front of you the mid-year adjustment. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, just I'll kind of review our cycle. Uh, in the spring, our UPWP and Finance Committee and Executive Committee all kind of work on our budget and work program. We adopt that in May of each spring for the following fiscal year, starts July 1. And of course, as we go through the year, um, or even at that time, there's typically some things that are tentative. Um, you know, we, we, there may be some conversation uh, that we're not sure how it will play out with a town or with a state agency. Uh, so there are grants that are pending. Um, and so uh, in the mid-year, uh, and there's also projects that either, you know, get started or don't get started. In the mid-year, we come back and try to do what we call a mid-year adjustment and try to right-size our budget and work program to be more accurately reflecting uh, what we're working on in this fiscal year. Um, I typically, if it's okay with you, Madam Chair, I'll pull up the budget just because that maybe gives, kind of gives a broad overview. I think uh, that's a good idea. And and I, 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 I always feel sorry for doing this to you all because I feel like I'm taking you into a spreadsheet. Eat too much, but um, can everybody see that now? Okay. Um, so um, this is our budget. The front side of this or the first part of it uh, kind of deals with our revenue sources. And uh, most of these rows align with different grant agreements with uh, either state agencies or municipalities. Um, and, you know, you'll see some adjustments here and it's really about us kind of right sizing where our staff hours go. There's a lot of detail behind this. Um, and so you'll see, you know, we kind of right size the regional planning grant to reflect what we're actually getting. Um, line row six here uh, is reflecting a, a new agreement that the legislature approved in the springtime, kind of after we put our budget together uh, to help municipalities uh, with pandemic recovery. I'm just going to kind of try to highlight the, the large changes here. Um, the MPO funding agreement is pretty much on level uh, with, with uh, where we were, uh, you know, one and a half percent off, um, with the exception um, that there are some additional consultant projects. Um, I think you all got an email from me a couple weeks ago. Um, I had a, a conversation with Chris Jolly at Federal Highway, uh, who uh, just trying to reconcile where we were in terms of our uh, federal funding for our MPO budget. Um, and he identified the fact that there were several hundred thousand dollars uh, available uh, to be programmed uh, if we could. Uh, so I did send out that request of like, hey, if you've got something you know, for FY23, that resulted in uh, a handful of also, how about this year, <laughs> FY22 projects um, which, if they had local match, um, seemed to make sense. So, um, and I don't know if I should review it here, but there's, um, I think, five projects. Um, one is uh, to uh, deal with Amtrak coming to Burlington in June, that uh, doing some extra work in Burlington, just about wayfinding and how do people get to and from the Amtrak station? Where do they park? How do they find a bike? How do they find a bus? Uh, those kinds of things. Um, one is a tentative project in Charlotte to help them get started on looking at their town highway garage. And Eleni, help me if, uh, if I get stuck here. One is uh, looking at the um, possibility, uh, kind of a technical feasibility of uh, some sort of transit intercept facility at the, in the south end of Burlington where the Champlain Parkway is going to land. Um, and I'm missing the fourth one. Uh, it's the East Charlotte Village Traffic Calming. Okay. Uh, yep. yep. Thank you. Um, and then the other one is the Winooski ADA Transition Plan. Thank you. Um, yep. And, so and then, a, yeah, and then Charlotte, and then Colchester. Colchester, right. And, and I apologize, I missed one project. So if you could, uh, as you consider a motion on this, 
uh, considered that uh, with what's in the what's with what's shown, plus this additional Colchester project um, to uh, kind of refine their pollution control, their sorry, their phosphorus control plan, um, and kind of delve into some more detail in in ten ten sites, I think, around the town. Um, so there's uh, kind of with that edit um, and and if you could give me a little bit of space, there may be a couple little tweaks, uh, you know, a little bit of dollars or hours here that we might need a little bit of adjustment. Um, so, um, so that's the MPO work, and that's why the um, sorry, just what I was really kind of focused on here was this two hundred forty nine thousand dollar increase in consultant dollars. That's what that is. Um, that um, and uh, according to Federal Highway, we have at least five hundred thousand available in this in this right now. Um, so this is not um, even depleting the resources available. Um, and I think as I noted in that email, we have probably a similar amount of new funding coming as a result of the infrastructure bill that um, Congress and the president uh, passed over the last couple months. Um, so that's previewing. Um, this uh, elderly and people with disability summit is a, a new uh, task here uh, with uh, VTRANS. Uh, funding to do in, uh, I can't remember, sometime next summer, I think, June, July, June. Um, and then there's a couple other um, new pots here that came out of the legislative action as ARPA money was flowing. One was uh, some extra brownfields money. Uh, so we got about $100,000 of brownfields. Um, and another one was uh, helping uh, municipalities focus on energy project implementation. Um, and uh, we hired Ann Janda to work on that work. Um, so this was uh, a, a significant amount for us to have increase our staff to help municipalities focus on energy projects. Um, and then um, other smaller ones. Yeah, I think um, this uh, this COVID impact on uh, racial, sorry, I'm looking at this uh, 168,000 COVID impact on racial health disparities. Um, this came up uh, late last year with the um, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, G got a grant from the Department of Health and they needed a fiscal agent. So we're just acting as kind of a pass through entity to work on those um, racial health disparities. And, and then there's a pro pending project here about healthy community design and equity also from the health department. Uh, any questions? Sorry, I'm, I feel like I'm down a bunch of rabbit holes. Uh, hopefully this is helpful, but um, on our whole revenue side, um, it's about in terms of our operations, which is kind of the staffing supports $114,000 more. There's uh, $500,000 more in the consultant, which is not just transportation, but some of these other things like, like the Racial Justice Alliance is part of that. Um, and so overall, our revenue side looks to be up around 12%. Any questions on this side? Before I move to the expense side. Right. Really, I have a question now. I've been pondering this between the Department of Health's work on um, health equity. They have a group that sort of works on that. Um, there are folks working the Agency of Human Services. Numerous health organizations have to do health, community health needs assessments, including home health agencies and hospitals. Um, and I'm sort of wondering, it feels like this is a new and expanded role, but maybe I've missed something in the history of the CCRPC's role in the context of those other yeah. entities and how they approach um, community health and health equities and disparities. Um, I'm going to say somewhat. Um, I think we yeah, had started relationships with like the medical center and the Department of Health, um, probably going back to the original ECOS plan, uh, going back 10 years ago. Um, so some of this is, um, I guess, follow up from the work that happened with our ECOS plan work 10 years ago, Bart. Um, but, but there is what happened. I think what you're really seeing is more money flowing into the system to address these issues and then them looking for more partners in how to do this work. Yeah, it was really more on like the racial health disparities and it seems like there's attention and stuff flowing there. And so far there is what I would describe as a paucity of, of data. Um, 
And so it just, it's just an observation. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I, you know, there is this emerging um, emphasis on um, health disparities and inequities. And I'll observe that our department perhaps has its own bias, that health equities and disparities are not limited to race. They are also associated with disability and age. And there is substantial evidence in both of those. Um, so it just, it, it's similar to the earlier conversation of, you know, are we talking health disparities uh, and inequities? Are we talking racial health disparities and inequities? Just kind of an interesting question. Yeah, and I, and I think, I'm sure we will come back to that um, in various topics and, and definitely an increased focus from the federal administration is part of what we're also, I think, feeling here. Uh, any other questions on the revenue side of the budget? Okay. Um, so I'm going to try to scroll over here to the uh, expense side. Sorry, I'm, I'm acting like you have this as a piece of paper, but this is this used to be a big piece of paper. So uh, on the back side was the expenses. Um, so I'm really highlighting, um, and I made reference uh, earlier to the um, the equity staff position. Um, and I highlighted these cells here to note that this budget does uh, propose um, this hiring an equity staff person for the, uh, the last few months of the fiscal year. And also uh, primarily because of the clean water service provider work, which you know, we've kind of talked about a little bit over the last couple of years, that's going to kick off in earnest in FY23. Um, and I'm also proposing uh, to uh, bring in a, uh, uh, somebody in our business office to help with that additional increment of administrative work that's going to be going on uh, in that arena. Uh, they won't exclusively work on that, but there's just a, another chunk of work coming to um, our business office that uh, really needs help. So there are, to be uh, totally transparent, two new positions proposed in this budget amendment, um, to be clear on, and that's kind of the budgetary impact um, so that those, those increases are really have to do with new positions, not raises or anything. Um, and then the rest of the expenses, <clears throat> force and I just adjusted to really try to right size and be more, uh, clear, um, with, uh, what our expenses look like. Um, the expenses, uh, the internal operations go up about 4%, the overall consultant 17%. So overall about 11%, we end up. Um, and now I'm going to get to the fun indirect rate conversation that I feel compelled to do each time. Um, so we started this fiscal year with a projected budget of minus 37,000. Uh, with these changes, it looks a little bit more optimistic. We get it down to negative 22,000. Um, and uh, for those of you not familiar with our budget, um, this is not because we don't know how to, you know, take revenue and subtract expenses. Um, it's really because of our indirect rate. So we do an indirect rate to apportion our indirect costs across all of our grant agreements. Um, and for FY22, um, this rate, well, for every year, it gets negotiated with VTRANS and as our kind of um, the, as part of their, well, responsibility to make sure we're following all the federal rules. Um, and in FY22, we're in a little bit of a under collection year. Um, and if you, so we have this table down at the bottom here, kind of showing the history of our indirect rates, what, what we were approved for, which means what we bill, and then what it actually was. And you can see that each year we either under or over collect. Um, and we appear to be caught in a little bit of a two year cycle where two years we under collect and then two years we over collect. Um, and we're, we've been trying to um, kind of reduce the swings. Um, you can see like back in FY17, we had an $85,000 swing or FY19, a $52,000 swing. So we've been trying over time as year, each year goes on to reduce these swings, but um, I just didn't want you to be concerned about a negative budget it's actually planned for because we over collected two years ago in our indirect rate costs. So we're now under collecting to try to be fair to those um, funding agencies. Sorry, that was 
maybe a lot more detail than you wanted. And at the very bottom of this, we also give you a little bit of cash balance report. Uh, so at the end of December, we were uh, $660,000 uh, in our accounts. Any questions Any question? on the budget? Yeah, and, and let me know if you want to delve into the work program. Um, that's a lot bigger spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> Jackie looks like a sane person. <laughs> That's like the one downside of being on that committee. How do you look at that spreadsheet? I'll stop sharing this. Any other questions or comments on uh, the, the mid-year adjustment budget? All right, I don't see any hands. So we will move on to the initial climate action plan and comprehensive energy plan. Uh, highlights and staff comments. Sorry, Madam Chair, before we move on, could we get action on the budget? Oh, that's right. That's with, uh, this. with the understanding that there's that additional Colchester project and we Sorry. may have some minor technical edits. Okay. Apologize for the loss of focus there. <laughs> uh, Garrett? Oops. Uh, is this an MPO vote? Or RPC. A uh, uh, full, full argument. Thank you. So, do we have a motion to um, accept the uh, the mid year adjustment and budget change uh, as changed? I'll move, Garrett. Second. Andy. Okay. Thank you, Andy. All those in favor, um, say aye or raise your hand. Either way. Aye. 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 Okay, so the Global Warming Solutions Act was enacted in September 2020. Um, right after that, the Climate Council was formed and they put together a climate action plan that was adopted on December 1st. They're calling it their initial plan because there will be updates um, and there's required updates every four years. Next slide. So the Global Warming Solutions Act has several requirements uh, for emissions reductions, uh, culminating in 80% uh, below 1990 levels by 2050. And this graphic just shows you the different sectors and those targets. Next slide. So the Climate Action Plan is organized um, around these five areas. Um, the biggest piece being the emissions reductions. And then there's two uh, areas that focus on resilience and adaptation to climate change. There's a section on carbon sequestration and storage and a section called cross-cutting pathways. So I wanted to be sure to include this slide uh, because there was a whole process in putting together uh, just transition uh, equity lens. And uh, there's a lot to that. All of the actions were filtered through this. Um, but the most important thing um, to think about is that the actions were prioritized so that the people who are most impacted uh, by climate change are addressed first. Next slide. So uh, along with greenhouse uh, gas emissions reductions, the plan also put forth what they're calling a carbon budget. And to begin looking at carbon sequestration as part of the equation, uh, this is a kind of a complicated table. I just wanted to put it out there so that you're aware of it. Uh, of the different sectors uh, for a carbon budget, the forest sector is extremely important for carbon sequestration. And um, the plan points out that there is a decrease in the carb, what they're calling the carbon sink in the forest sector, and that we um, should do further investigation to find out why, but that um, protecting our forests for their carbon sequestration is extremely important. Next slide, please. Okay, so I am gonna go over the pathways and actions for emissions reductions. Uh, first is the transportation sector. 
uh, the most emissions come from the transportation sector. Um, the first pathway uh, is calls for uh, electrification of, uh, I guess, uh, what they're calling light duty vehicles, um, which we would call cars, I guess, cars, SUVs, trucks. Um, and to electrify 170,000 of these light duty vehicles by 2030, they propose to do this through regulation, expanded ex incentives, uh, continuing uh, programs for lower income folks to participate uh, in electric vehicles, more EV charging and more outreach and education. So in addition to that, they're looking to electrify medium and heavy duty vehicles, um, very similar through regulation and incentives, but also looking at idle reduction systems as well. Next slide. And then the third pathway is to reduce vehicle miles traveled. Uh, the big, the big action that is proposed is for VTRANS to create a transportation implementation plan uh, that focuses on things like smart growth strategies, establishing specific targets for um, vehicle miles traveled, increasing public transit, and then if possible, free public transit, expanding Amtrak, and really ensuring that the Complete Streets program is working as well as it can. So the second big sector is buildings and thermal. That is where um, of, of the second largest emissions come from our heating and cooling of buildings. And the big push in the plan is to weatherize 90,000 homes by 2030. There is a workforce development issue there uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, there also propose energy and financial coaching, um, possibly on bill financing, which would put the cost for uh, weatherization onto um, the utility bill and efficiency standards for rental properties, as well as um, zero energy ready uh, Building Energy Code by 2030. Next slide. So this is actually not from the plan, but um, from a memo that the um, Climate Council sent to the legislature uh, asking to use um, some ARPA dollars to assist with uh, a developing work workforce for weatherization. As you can see, in order to meet the goal, uh, there's a lot of people um, needed to do this work. Next slide. Um, so the second pathway has to do with reducing the carbon content of fuels. And the big proposal here is for a clean heat standard for fossil fuel heat wholesalers uh, that includes natural gas. Uh, essentially what that means is that they would be asking uh, these folks to either diversify um, from just fossil fuels to other um, renewable fuels or to diversify into doing things like selling um, uh, cold climate heat pumps or, or purchasing credits um, in lieu of those things. Next slide. So the electricity sector, uh, the big push is for either 100% carbon-free electricity or 100% renewable electricity by 2030. Um, secondly, um, enabling all Vermonters to choose electrification. This means everyone has to have 200 amp service in their homes. And focusing on utility load control programs. If everything electrifies, um, there needs to be some load management and grid optimization involved. And then next, the agriculture sector. There are quite a few recommendations here. They're all uh, reasonable, excellent um, recommendations. I won't necessarily go through these, but um, they're all geared towards reducing emissions and enhancing um, the sinks of uh, greenhouse gases. So the non-energy sector, 
There's three things there uh, they focused on. Um, the first one is reducing emissions of refrigerants. Second is reducing process emissions from semiconductor manufacturing, which actually produces really high greenhouse gases. Um, and then reducing uh, fugitive emissions from wastewater treatment facilities, which essentially means uh, making sure that the flare systems in the anaerobic digesters are working properly. Okay, so now we're moving on to resilience, adaptation, carbon sequestration, and what they're calling cross-cutting pathways. So there were so many um, recommendations here. I only pulled out the ones that I thought were noteworthy um, for um, municipal purposes. Uh, so these are, uh, these are the ones having to do with land use. Uh, there's a big push for low impact development, smart growth, um, walking, biking, public transit, uh, also a statewide conversation about land use, possibly um, putting together a committee to um, look at developing a statewide land use planning policy, possibly creating a statewide planning office and making significant revisions to Act 250 to co uh, support compact settlement. And then the next grouping here has to do with supporting um, local energy and resilience projects. So uh, putting some funding towards climate and energy planning, evaluating the enhanced energy plans that municipalities have to make sure they're doing as much as they can supporting electrification of municipal fleet vehicles, actually adding some resources to RPCs for um, weatherization, uh, efficiency, natural resource planning, um, and requiring uh, municipalities to, to collect fossil fuel usage data. And, and importantly, making sure all utilities provide similar rebates and incentives, which now you know, different utilities have different incentives so it's not the same across the state. And then lastly, forest health and conservation, uh, really, uh, again, making sure that uh, our forests are healthy, uh, that there are programs for landowners to know how to uh, manage um, land and climate adaptive ways uh, and enhancing support for municipalities to maintain forest blocks possibly authorizing ANR to have statewide jurisdiction over river corridors and all kinds of development there. Okay, so that was a lot. Um, what happens now is it goes to the legislature. Uh, They're going to be picking the uh, areas that they want to support first, what their priorities are, uh, looking at ARPA funds to fund some of these things. Um, the Climate Council is going to uh, be looking at how to, what kind of data they want to look at and track, uh, as well as ensuring um, diverse appointments on the council. So the Climate Council continues to meet. Um, they have a calendar. Um, meetings are open to the public. Uh, and there's also a place to um, provide comments if you have ideas, suggestions. Okay, do we have time to go over? Okay, so the comprehensive energy plan uh, is different from the, the climate action plan. This is something that happens, I believe, every six years. Um, next slide, please. Um, it's through the Department of Public Service. Um, it some of the things that are that the Comprehensive Energy Plan focuses on overlaps with the Climate Action Plan. Uh, and then there's some areas that are, are totally different, but they did um, sort of work in tandem so that they understood what each other was working on. So these are the targets for the Comprehensive Energy Plan. I only highlighted what's new in this plan as opposed to um, the 2016 plan. Uh, and what we noted with the, these new goals is that this comprehensive energy plan shifts its focus more to 
from short-term renewables to decarbonization. Um, so that's going to change the focus a little bit. Next slide. So the areas that the Comprehensive Energy Plan focuses on is electricity, transportation, and thermal. Next slide. Okay, so for transportation and land use, uh, the overarching goal is to increase the number of electric vehicles in Vermont to have 100% light duty vehicle sales in Vermont to be zero emissions by 2035, and also to prioritize um, transportation demand management. Slides. So the recommendations are similar to the cap in um, accelerating EV sales continuing uh, programs for lower income folks to participate. Also facilitating EV market share through supporting um, charging and managing the electric grid impacts from the increased, um, the increased use of electricity through electric vehicles. And then the next pathway has to do with cleaner vehicles and fuels. So increasing vehicle fuel efficiency while we wait um, for you know, everyone to have an electric car, um, it's important um, to really encourage uh, fuel efficiency and low carbon fuels. Next slide. And then also enhancing the integration of land use planning into transportation decision-making frameworks. Um, so it's really important to reduce vehicle miles traveled through uh, support of compact and mixed use settlement. And then increasing transportation choices. Um, the plan does mention, you know, kind of, we already invest heavily in transportation demand options and should continue to do so. Our, our feeling as staff is that um, more needs to be done. Slide. Okay, so thermal and process energy has um, the following goals. And the big recommendations here are similar to the cap, which is weatherization priority, uh, net zero energy code by 2030. Again, a clean heat standard for heating fuel providers was exactly the same as what I mentioned in the cap. And encouragement of cleaner fuels, such as advanced wood heat. Slide. So lastly, and, and maybe most importantly, this, this slide explains why the focus on so much on decarbonization rather than um, increasing goals for renewable energy. Uh, we are having some hosting capacity issues. Uh, we actually have pretty high solar penetration. However, it's limited by our substation transformers. Um, typically what's done in this situation is to upsize substation transformers, but that costs millions of dollars. There's other things that we can do, such as promoting battery storage and other ways to um, manage grid load. Uh, but one starting point that the Comprehensive Energy Plan suggests is that all utilities have maps, such as Green Mountain Power's map, where we can look at where um, we can really see uh, the bottlenecks and uh, where we need to focus uh, uh, siting solar energy in, in a way that works with the grid uh, most effectively. Okay, so that is my presentation. Thank now that was the information. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> It's a lot of material to cover there. Are uh, any questions or comments at this point? So, Anne, I'm trying to find this uh, presentation or the suggested plan, and it's not up yet, or this is the first version of it. Uh, how, how, how will we find this? Are you talking about the, the comprehensive energy plan or the climate? climate I went, I went to the initial Vermont climate action plan on the official Vermont government website there, climatechange.vermont.gov, the links that you had in that presentation there. 
and none of the links are operable. Okay, I will put a link in the chat here. Great, it, it may be the same site, but I, when I go deeper, there's nothing really material-wise on there that's uh, good, working yet. Okay, oh, got it right here. Any other questions or comments while Ann is working on this? Regina has also put the uh, comprehensive energy plan in the chat. Thank you, that works great. Comments, questions? Yeah. Is Dr. there Scott any is discussion in about how much this is gonna cost to do anywhere? Right, uh, so there, there are some if you look through some of the recommendations, there are some dollars that are um, estimated in there for some recommendations. Some recommendations just say consider funding. Um, there's a lot of consider funding throughout the document. So it's really a matter of the legislature, you know, looking at all of these things and, and prioritizing. Oh, so this is at the state level anyway, this is gonna come with other uses and things like that. In other words, we're, we're sitting here right now with an unprecedented amount of money that's coming from federal deficit spending sources, which is raining down on our state. And um, that's going to run dry pretty soon. And so I'm just wondering when we start to talk about the very, very uh, significant goals for EVs and the amount of infrastructure spending that's going to be needed to be able to support those, not to mention direct, you know, um, uh, incentives. Uh, that's got to be a huge amount of money and it's going to be competing with other very worthwhile needs in areas such as childcare and workforce development and all that kind of stuff. So I just was wondering if, you know, those are very lofty goals, but um, how much money is it going to take for us to get there? Good question. We do know there's 25 million um, coming from the federal government over the next five years um, for um, EV charging. We we don't make a very big contribution as a state to every one of those federal dollars, but somebody does. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Well, yeah, I have one. This is Bart again, I'm sorry. Um, you know, picking up on this question of the investment of EV charging stations, I, I'll just observe, I've been wrestling with a long time about what it's going to take to upgrade the transmission system to support all the charging stations and electric vehicles, right? That um, we've talked about this before, that there seemed at least some level of disconnect between what we want to have for electric vehicles and charging stations and the transmission line capacity to support them. Yeah, that was certainly something that came out of the presentation on the VEC issues. I'm not the VL, yeah. The, the transmission. Elko. Elko, yes. Yeah, yeah, if you remember, we had them here a few months ago, yeah, talking about that very issue. These are, there's a lot of issues for the legislature to wrestle with here, for sure, and the administration. Well, stay tuned. And money will run out after so many years. It's true. Yeah, and I'll just add that. Um, so we are embarking on the ECOS plan update. So uh, we will be looking um, internally, too, at our energy plan and trying to get it up to speed with comprehensive energy plan um, and just thinking thinking through. And I, I imagine... Um, we probably won't get into too much detail about the grid challenges, but we'll definitely highlight that like we did to Velco and, and we did uh, to the Comprehensive Energy Plan as well. In the chat, there is a comment from the public if, um, you know, we, if you wish to hear it. 
because we very seldom get a public comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the comment is, um, is there a recommended split in funding between EV charging versus focusing of mode shift to public transit, which would have bigger equity benefits to zero car household concentrated in communities like when you see in the old north end? Uh, I do know that increasing public transit and making public transit possibly free ongoing is is a recommendation. Um, I'm not quite sure about the the funding. Yeah, my, my guess is we're going to have to see how the legislature balances those. I, I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, so yes, yeah, stay tuned, Mr. Arnold. Thank you. It's a good question. Yeah, it, the funding of um, transit is, is a real issue because uh, like when they've tried to um, send GMT out to the rural communities with uh, <clears throat> when the gas prices dropped and COVID hit, I mean, the, the number of people using transit certainly dropped to where it's not economical for GMT, but certainly at the same time, that's something we need to consider going forward and, and, and not lose that momentum of having transit in uh, other areas other than the, the inner cities. So any other comments or questions um, for Anne? Or and certainly, you know, I'm gonna observe as uh, I think Matt did, Michael did uh, about the transit for GMT, I heartily agree that, you know, to maximize the use of public transportation, it should be free. The shuttle that runs from UVM downtown back up uh, gets heavily utilized for that reason. You know, and people would be using the public transport a lot more. Uh, you know, and, and we're talking pennies. It's it's an unconscionable that we're trying to run it out of the fare box. Uh, you know, this is a public service in the same way that if you're going to change over your cars from gasoline power, which are just poisoning the planet, to electric. You want to encourage it and you want to accelerate it to the extent that if it was affordable, if the government and, and uh, there were resources where you could swap one for one a new electric vehicle for an old clunker, uh, a gas spewing clunker, then it should be done for the sake of uh, right now because of the immediacy of, of the need, the urgency. But the cycle track issues and uh, dealing with the walkability within dense uh, impact, uh, dense development are things that are also needed and rather than prioritizing uh, the car centric uh, communities that we've built and we can do that. It's been difficult. Uh, South Burlington has had uh, a real arm wrestling match over a cycle track on Market Street. It never happened because of course the bike and pedestrian committee wanted it but the, the remainder of the city uh, uh, said we can't do it. it, it's not friendly. And yet, if you built a cycle track separated, people will use their bicycles more, you will send your kids to the downtown. If you create a network of these sheltered bike lanes, you will find people will be using bikes more and more. And that begins to move the needle away from where we've been prioritizing 60 foot rights of way for cars and all that other stuff. Uh, we need to make some changes along those lines. We can't just go from a gasoline powered car society to an electric powered car society and say that we've saved ourselves and planted. It's healthier lifestyle with the cycle tracks. It's healthier with the public. Well, maybe not during a pandemic, but I think it's better for us all, for human life um, and for our enjoyment of same, um, that we encourage those alternative methods more and more rather than keep paying heed to uh, 120 year old technology. Thank you, Chris. I certainly agree with that. Um, any other comments or questions? I don't see any hands or any other comments. Um, since this was a uh, an interesting discussion. I'm sure we will be cycling back to a lot of these things as they become more specific in the, whether it's in the EPWP or some other, <laughs> or even uh, climate action and uh, energy plan uh, implementation plans. <laughs> um, next, 
is a um, discussion on the legislative priorities review and legislative debriefing. Uh, so um, in your packet, I have a, a kind of a two page table. Uh, we've kind of committed to the board every six months to kind of review uh, legislative policy priorities kind of uh, at the beginning of the session. And then we'll do this again, uh, probably July after the session uh, ended and uh, we see what the governor signed or not. Um, I don't know, let me know if you want me to share that, if that's easier or, um, but uh, I, I won't share it unless somebody asks. Um, but um, these are pretty much the policy uh, topics are pretty consistent with what you saw six months ago. Uh, clean water, uh, still tracking that. Uh, the transportation bill in general, uh, you know, we track that a bit each year to see what's happening. Uh, you may have seen um, a number of legislators uh, are supporting a bill to what I think they call the Transportation Innovation Act to kind of follow up on a lot of the conversation we just heard. Um, I'm not sure how much traction that will get um, in House Transportation and we'll, so we'll, we'll be watching that. Um, transit financing is a little bit of a, different topic. Um, this is something that uh, was in our work program in the last year. Um, Marshall Distel on our staff uh, worked with a consultant and GMT and VTrans. Um, uh, we delivered that report to House Transportation last week and Senate Transportation the week before. Um, so they were both interested in hearing about transit financing options. Again, following up, up on the conversation you were just having about uh, either fair free transit and or reducing the uh, burden on property taxes, you know, municipalities, municipal budgets to support transit service. Um, one piece of information I will share out of those conversations uh, with regard to the idea of continuing fair free service, which we've had since the pandemic started, um, is the disparity between the cost of doing that for the rural transit services in the rest of the state versus our urban transit service in Chittenden County. And to give you a sense of that issue, it's about $500,000-ish to make transit in the rest of the state fare free. So they get 500,000 something dollars historically from the fare box. In Chittenden County, that number is 2.2 million. And so, um, I have the impression that we'll see how this shakes out that they will probably likely continue fare free service in the rural transit system in the rest of the state. Um, and I think it's a very open question as to whether they will um, find 2.2 million uh, to support the GMT service in our core, uh, in our GMT service area um, in the core of Chittenden County. So, um, just heads up on that issue, I guess, so, uh, just because we heard a little bit more detail on that. Um, okay. Yes, sir. Sorry. Do you have any information on, on ridership and, you know, how many rides we're talking rural? Mm -hmm. So some kind of a, of an analysis of cost per ride, if you will. I did it not. Be, it would be much, it's cheaper per ride in, in Chittenden County than it is in other areas, but that may be my prejudice too. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't remember seeing those numbers. Mike, all I saw was kind of the budget numbers. Um, um, yeah, if you're really interested, we could follow up with Ross at VTrans and get a, he probably has a quick breakdown he might be able to share. Okay, um, thanks. Yeah, I guess, I'm um, sorry, I'm seeing Elaine nodding. So I think between her and I, we'll try to follow up with Ross um, and share those numbers uh, after this meeting. Um, the uh, fourth topic area, um, the perennial favorite of Act 250 reform, hope springs eternal. Um, and so uh, we'll see. Um, and again, you saw this notion of Act 250 reform mentioned in the climate uh, action plan. Um, there's, there's some pieces, there's uh, several bills proposed in that area. Um, I do expect, it does seem like there's uh, enough of a priority coming from both the administration and the legislature that I expect they'll move something forward. We'll kind of keep following that to see what it is. Uh, not clear yet what it is, although I expect 
that it's likely to be something that um, makes it easier for villages around the state to have housing development uh, without being subject to Act 250. Um, but again, we'll we'll see um, if that actually comes to pass. Um, broadband is the fifth topic we have on here. Um, and uh, particularly interested in seeing if they can uh, make some funds available to Chittenden County municipalities that are not members of communication union districts, CUDs. Um, we'll uh, keep tracking what's happening with any climate change implementation bills. Um, there is a lot, uh, as you just heard, there's a lot there uh, for the legislature to chew on and uh, they will have, I'm sure, a lot of conversations about what to move forward with. Um, the, uh, there's another uh, topic kind of related uh, happening in the Public Utilities Commission, uh, a, a rule change about uh, forest uh, protection, um, which is kind of related to that sequestration topic and just mentioned. Um, so we'll monitoring that, uh, following a little bit of what's happening with the uh, cannabis policy, uh, particularly around uh, needs for municipal zoning. And there's also uh, a more uh, fiscal issue about whether municipalities will be able to share in some of that revenue, particularly if they're hosting a retail establishment. Um, project specific TIF um, is, I think it's also coming up in Senate Economic Development right now. Um, there may be equity related bills. Um, I, know, I think we, you saw some mention maybe in Ann's presentation about uh, kind of an environmental justice bill uh, that seems to have some momentum, uh, which a lot of other states have and we don't. Um, municipal self-governance is the 11th topic on this list. Um, this is uh, something that particularly VLCT is, uh, and, and a number of our towns uh, have also supported some level of this, of, you know, do we need to go back to the legislature to ask for every charter change on every specific, if a bunch of other towns have already gotten that permission? Um, so I talked to Ted Brady. I think they're going to try to advance some things there. Open meeting law. Uh, hopefully you saw the legislature started to address what happens in town meeting. And I can't remember if that bill um, also um, might open the door for 100% virtual meetings going forward or that may be under some further discussion. I don't, I would Regina, certainly do like to see the, uh, <clears throat> them, if nothing else, to allow fully remote meetings from December through March, because that way, you know, you know, it, it serves a lot of, you know, it's, it's, you know, does the greenhouse gases, vehicle miles travel, da, 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 but it's also a public safety issue so that people don't have to have at least one person even in the town hall during those kind of, uh, you know, uh, weather events so that people can stay home and, uh, you know, protect yes. the climate and stay warm at the same time. Yep. <laughs> yeah. My understanding is that sort of on the sidelines for more discussion um, and they were just comfortable moving forward that what we're working with right now through January 15th, 2023, so we can see what's going on with COVID at that point. Oh, Bard, you're saying S222 did allow fully remote meetings that was just signed? Yeah, this is Brad. Um, the governor oh, did do that as well as um, the same... Um, provisions um, uh, waiving the petition signatures. Mm -hmm. So you could just basically fill out a form and get on the um, on the ballot. Uh, thanks for that. Good update, Brad. Thank you. Thank you for tracking that more closely than we are. <laughs> Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the, the last few, uh, the rental registry bill, I think uh, looks like the legislature is taking that back up. We'll uh, track that a little bit. Um, and then a couple more uh, just funding bills um, still will be asking, I think, the, um, the uh, for capital dollars to support the startup of the regional dispatch center. Um, and then the final one, and this is kind of a new one, is that um, we're having conversation with uh, legislators about how to fund RPCs. Um, there's a formula in statute uh, that they have notwithstanding been not following for, <laughs> for 20 years. Um, and our funding uh, from the Agency of Commerce uh, from the property transfer tax has not really changed very much in the last 20 years. So um, they were very um, committed to investing in, in us last session. Uh, and in this fiscal year, um, 
we're hoping that continues. And it's just kind of a question of how, how that continues. But um, again, as you saw from the climate presentation, there uh, look to be more asks of us in that arena um, to, to help move things forward. So we're kind of monitoring what's happening there. And I think the same thing's happening somewhat on the housing side too. So between climate and housing, um, it does seem like some more demand. Um, that is my quick summary of the pending policy. And is anyone aware of anything else that we really should be tracking that's not on that list? Uh-oh, Dana. Yeah, I just want to point out that, um, to circle back to Act 250, the way I'm looking at it for this session, there's really going to be unprecedented pressure on um, local permitting and state permitting Act 250 to ease restrictions um, for housing development. Mm -hmm. And if the board members who are on the VTA listserv and get, get these great weekly updates on what's going on in the legislature is great, but for the board members who are not on the VPA listserv, I, I would really think it'd be great if you guys could keep us posted on um, the whole regulatory relief issue around housing on the local and state levels, because I think it's going to be quite an interesting discussion this session. Yeah, yeah it, it will be, and yeah, it's hard to tell exactly how that will play out, but yeah, we'll keep monitoring that. Um, and I, I will, I'll, Regina and I will kind of talk about the best way to maybe provide updates. Um, Dana, for the rest of you who are not on the Vermont Planners Association listserv, um, there's a weekly update that comes uh, from the Vermont Planners Association. Um, and maybe we can just maybe excerpt, particularly on this Act 250 housing topic area, um, that portion and, it, would you all be interested in getting a weekly little legislative update like that? I certainly would. Yeah, okay. All right, well, we will, we will do our best to share. Uh, Regina probably just looked at me cross-eyed, uh, but uh, she's, yeah, she's, uh, and Regina's taken on a little bit more responsibility with the Vermont Planners Association, uh, the chairing their legislative committee. So, so she's in a good spot to see what's going on there. Uh, we'll try to- I was going to say, uh, sorry, Charlie, but I think the regional dispatch, you know, may have more precedence this year too, because our our local fire department notified both Underhill and, and Jericho that they're having, you know, they had to increase their budget by twenty thousand dollars, because this, the the uh, uh, state police dispatch has said they cannot. Um, continue to uh, service them. In fact, is right now because the Williston is so underserved that they are just doing the absolute minimum amount of uh, dispatch that they, they can do to the, the like our local fire department and mm -hmm. rescue. Thanks for um, sharing that, that's helpful. Yeah, so that uh, in fact is the $20,000 is to get the last slot the children dispatch had open. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that there are going to be more more of the uh, the smaller uh, ones that rely on state police dispatch uh, that are going to be looking for some kind of dispatch. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, questions on the prior or comments on the priorities for uh, Charlie before we move on to the the, the next item, which keeps Charlie talking. <laughs> yeah, I apologize, and I didn't. Um... I didn't ask about uh, any feedback from the legislative briefing on, or that we had in early uh, December, but it seems like it was so long ago, we'll move on. Uh, so um, the uh, one thing in my report, I just wanted to uh, give you a heads up that we're having a public meeting on the 89 study um, with a particular focus, um, actually uh, kind of following up on that climate presentation, uh, really focusing on transportation demand management strategies and, and kind of um, uh, how to address uh, climate actions. Um, so it's kind of an interesting process we went through with a, a, a strategic model, uh, an econometric model, not a typical, uh, for those of you who've been following NPO work, we you know, use a, a traffic demand model that we've you know, used to project traffic volumes. And this was much more of a policy oriented uh, uh, economic based model about uh, what makes people make different decisions. So um, we'll share that uh, probably in February with you all um, 
to uh, kind of give you some feedback about how that public meeting went and where the 89 advisory committee uh, landed on those topics. Uh, but that's the end of my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Charlie. Uh, the, your committee and liaison uh, uh, activities and reports are um, uh, available via uh, link or by it within the packet for depending on your preference. Uh, so we'll, you know, with that said, we can move on to future agenda topics. Yep. And on the second page of your packet, or, uh, or as again, as I think about it on the back of the agenda, um, there's some tentative future board agenda items. So uh, they're there. Uh, the hazard mitigation plan is coming up uh, for kind of review and adoption in the next couple months. Uh, I just mentioned the 89 study, looking at the TDM results. Um, also, also thought that we'd give you a little bit more detail about that transit financing study. Um, it's out there publicly now, but just so you're familiar with what it is and um, you, know, you may wanna engage on that at some point. Um, and we'll have probably a, a consent item on the transportation safety performance measures that we have every year uh, at your next meeting. Um, and then most of the other stuff, it gets a little bit more administrative, you know, kind of getting uh, ready for uh, budget and work program, uh, FY23, uh, executive committee nominations and things like that. Um, any topics or items that people feel like uh, we should try to add to a future agenda? Sorry, I know we gave you a lot tonight and you're exhausted. So thank you for sticking with us. Yes, thank you, everybody. Um, next is members items and other business. And, you know, at the risk of carrying this on before adjournment, uh, I wanna thank Bard for what he talked about, about how the planning commission works. Uh, Chuck has some really cares about affordable housing. There's no question about that. However, um, because he sees the select board as the one who makes the final approval of zoning regulations, just like most other towns, um, he's focused on the select board rather than the planning commission work, which is unfortunate because then he doesn't get the picture like we were talking about with the climate action plan and Act 250, everything mm -hmm. is focused on uh, low, more dense, um, building rather than plunking something down in the middle of a you know 10 acre lot uh, out in the open space area where you're going to have all the transportation issues and the climate issues and everything else rather than actually it being affordable you're going to need transportation rather than putting it within the village center the planning commission has been working very hard on um, making changes to adus and using the uh, state uh, better government, better neighborhoods protocol and stuff, but unfortunately, Chuck wants things done yesterday by the select board. But so I appreciate the time that you know. I felt that I shouldn't just let it look like Jericho is a real outlier <laughs> in terms of planning. <laughs> but you know, but I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to really take people's time at the beginning either. <laughs> Catherine, so, I, I would just observe, okay that even though we follow Robert's rules, that in that instance, that a parliamentary inquiry should have shut that comment down because it was something that was on the agenda. Secondly, we also received the public comment in the middle of a, our agenda when there was no opportunity for the public to comment. So we are not rigidly adhering to Robert's rules. Well, and you. I believe that uh, you know, we use it to guide our decisions, but I don't believe that we use it to exclude because if we did, we would have excluded that input. I, can I, I observe, Jeff, I think that's um, really well put. And in fact, I conspicuously was out of order when I was commenting on a public comment, <laughs> arguably. <laughs> like, so it's an example, I think, of where Robert's rules are guidance to perhaps polite sequential conversation as opposed to closing things down. And notwithstanding the comments earlier that they can be off-putting for people who are unfamiliar or people from other cultures, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, it's important to take, uh, you know, comments when they come, if, 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 if it is real, all related to what we're discussing. Thank you. If, is there any other members items or other business from anyone? If not, then we can entertain a motion to adjourn. 
Garrett. I'll, I'll second Garrett's motion to adjourn. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you all. It was a very good meeting and really some nice discussion. Yeah, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. So long, everyone. Thanks, Catherine. Good night. Good night. See you next month.